Hi, 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 everyone. So you're here with us at Australian Multicultural Platform. And today we are talking with Michael Dudek about his community involvement. So but first of all, um, just wanted to introduce some of our panel, introduce some of our panel. Um, so Megan, would you like to tell everyone what you do? Hi, I'm Megan Marie. Um, I am the owner of Peace, Love and Light and Healing with Megan Marie, and I am a mental health wellness coach. Hi, Zico Johnson. And I said to you earlier, uh, my role is a volunteer in the community. I'm a real advocate. And my major achievement will be how we can make the world a better place, how we all can work collectively to make this world a better place to live. Yes. And I'm Nicole, as you know, Nicole Butler. And I do um, so business advisory, community advocacy, and family and children facilitator. Or practitioner. So here we have Michael. Michael, tell us more about you. Hey, and uh, yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate it. So my name is Michael Dudek. I'm currently running for the local government, City of Stirling Council in the Balga Ward, suburbs of Balga, Mirabuka, Nolamara, and Westminster in Perth, Australia. Um, basically, uh, for work, I'm a finance professional. I work with a fam my family business been doing that for the last seven or eight years. It's uh, It's been good. It gives me a good insight into the world of business. Um, but I've also, you know, got a lot of other things going. I'm very into my sport, my music, and um, also my studies back in the day. But um, nowadays, my focus has firmly been in the business world and the sporting world, and also um, a lot to do with tutoring mathematics to uh, people in different communities within the community that I work in. I'm sure we'll de delve a lot more into it as we go, but I think that's a fairly good summary of what I do. Wow. I love all of that. Oh my gosh, my brain's going. Tell me more about this tutoring with children. <clears throat> yeah, well, um, I mean, it started when I was at university. So I went to UWA. I used to tutor Indigenous children at the at Balga Senior High School as part of the Ignite Mentorship Program. Um, I did that quite a lot, and it was really good being able to work with the kids. They have a specialist program there where they intertwine sport and academics to try and get the attendance rates up, et cetera, for Indigenous kids in Australia. Um, I, didn't I didn't have involvement in the sporting program there at the school that was more uh, an internal school program but i would uh often um come in just during the week and tutor kids help them out with their maths homework their english homework science whatever they were doing maths is more my specialty but um for high school i can usually lend my hand to a few of those subjects um nowadays i uh, since uni, I volunteer my time tutoring uh, some Sudanese Australians. So I've been doing that for the past year. Um, I've got two students. Um, basically, uh, they're friends of friends uh, that I've known through soccer and through playing that. They were struggling with their mathematics and I offered to help. So that's not so much part of a program, but something that I like to do. And, you know, it... Um, I definitely, in terms of the Sudanese community that I'm close with, when I see their parents working really hard to provide a good education for their kids, pay for them to go to a nice school, um, I I don't like to hear that they're struggling, especially with something like maths, which I do have experience helping out in. So that's uh, that's what I've been doing in terms of that space. I've had to put it on hold for the last month while I've been campaigning, but um, as of next week, I'll be able to pick them back up again and uh hopefully set them on the right track that is so oh i love that i've got some special um sudanese friends and wow that just oh that's so awesome that you're doing that because they do right they do work so hard and yeah so it's so nice that you actually give back because i uh it's so important yes. right you know oh yeah it is definitely and you know they uh do the same for me if i needed help i've um been playing with uh, soccer with uh, Sudanese Australians, the Sudanese club for the past four years. So they've helped me out with many things. They've been helping me out with my campaign. So the least I can do is is help them where they need it. 
Wow, that's so special. I see that I've got Balga is a football club on saying that you're the king of Balga. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Appreciate that. That's uh, Balga Futsal Club, so indoor soccer. Oh, uh, real. Oh, okay. I did not. That is so cool. Thank you very much for letting us know that he's the king. By the way, if you want to let us know other things that you want to comment about, that'd be awesome. Okay. And so, um, Zico, did you want to have some questions? Yeah, uh, firstly, I would say again, thank you, uh, Margaret Duda, for accepting uh, our invitation today to be on this platform. Uh, it's a good thing, you know, to come on and talk about what you engage, what, engage with and what you want to see happening. Uh, I will follow you on Facebook, and I see a lot of good work, you know, we engage with uh, event collection, talking to people in Armada, mm -hmm. talking in Baga and other areas. And I've been thinking, how do you handle the issue of multicultural living within the community. You engage with sport. How do you put different people, people from diverse background together uh, in achieving this productivity? How hard do it work for you? Um, well, I don't know about putting them together specifically. Okay, let me ministry. hang on, hang on a little bit. Let me open the discussion a little bit. Hang on. Yeah. You, 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 you met a whole team of people uh, South Sudanese that you talk about, an Australian people from, let's say, different background, and other of them want to be a part of a team. Yeah, you're may coming out and you're always engaging in the sport activity. What are those seconds there? That's a, what are the difficulties you face? The first goal of the difficulty you face, bringing other than together, you know? Well, um, I don't know that there's that much difficulty I face. There are some cultural rivalries you get in australia though they're a lot more mild in australia than you might get over um, back home where they're from but the soccer club i play for brings together liberians sudanese um people from the congo uh into the one environment and i think we do a fairly good job of seeing each other as brothers as opposed to where we're from you know obviously i'm not from africa i'm from um Australia, my dad was from Poland, my mum from England, uh, though I was born here and grew up here. Uh, I've never felt any, you know, uh, difference being involved in the club, um, though I do very much enjoy it. And I, I couldn't tell you what difficulties I face. Uh, sometimes there are some issues that come up within the community that I hear of, which is North versus south rivalries um amongst young africans and i know a lot of the older africans are very keen to try and stamp the behavior out and not let it infect their young people so what i what i like to do is try work with the young the youth productively i think if we can provide more sporting opportunities things like that for them they're m less likely to get involved in these divisions and uh, difficulties that, you know, that comes with being a teenager. You know, I'm sure all of us were young and a bit wild at some point. Um, but, you know, the more community resources we have to get people involved, I think the less likely they are to go down bad paths. So difficulties, I mean, again, I don't really know how to answer it apart from there's, there are many, but they're also um, there not too important because in australia we're stuck together where we are a multicultural country we're not going anywhere so everyone yeah. i think sees that we just need to work work through differences and work together that's good that's good i, I think i think my question answer well you know uh and i want to look at the regulator the issue of the then collection you always post in a picture i see you posting a picture close to some of the rubbish you know things that are not right in the neighborhood and you're so passionate that those things shouldn't be around. But what plans, you know, do you have to get to get into the right place? Yeah, so the, uh, and this is, yeah, a big in issue of my campaign is I'm campaigning to bring Verge Collections back, which, uh, Megan, for yourself in America, I don't know if you have these. They're uh, annually, uh, about five years ago, we had them in the city of Sterling. Annually, everyone would be able to put out their junk from the year on their Verge and leave it there for, you know, for say two weeks until it gets collected by 
the government. Um, so all your junk that you've got piled up in your house, you do a clean out once a year, put it out in your verge and the government comes and cleans it out once a year. They got rid of that. those. Um, uh, sorry, yeah. Do you have that in America? We do have that. Not every area, but you do have areas that in communities that are, they do the cleanups, you know, so it's, you know, those old tires and stuff like that, that you have piled in your backyard, put it out because if you try to take it other places, there's fees and stuff. And so people, <clears throat> excuse me, don't get rid of it. And so, yeah, you have communities that are stepping up of like, Hey, we'll come load it all off, you know, just put it all outside. Yeah. No, fair enough. Yeah. So, the government stopped doing those verge collections a few years ago and instead replaced it with a skip bin system where you could order once a year. Unfortunately, not many people are using it. So what you get in our community is a lot of dumping and illegal dumping on the side of the roads, in parks, you get couches just left up there. Um, the reason I'm so passionate about bringing verge collections back is I think it will help, help stop that illegal dumping. If it's not piling up in people's houses, they're not using these skip bins. So we need to try and do something uh if we return to that i think it will you know make a difference clean up the area you're not going to get that sort of rubbish left around but the goal behind it is having a cleaner area also brings a sense of pride um a sense of community to the place that you live a higher sense of investment if you feel proud of it and it's not filled with rubbish or junk around the place so that's why i why i'm passionate about it why i want to bring it back um and also the convenience aspect of it. Uh, I mean, I've made about five trips to the tip this year. Each time it cost me $50. Um, again, for myself, it's not sending me broke, but for a lot of people within our area, it's not an expense that they can afford to make. So uh, I want to reduce that, bring back those Verge collections and do a lot of other things as well that will help clean up the area. I think it comes with restoring a sense of pride. You're less likely to get people dumping couches on the side of the roads, um, in parks, things like that. Yeah. Giving them the convenience of having just stick it outside. You'll have so many more people who, cause I mean, let's face it. I mean, we're lazy in so many different ways, but that's not something you think of constantly of like wanting to take off your trash, you know, are necessarily big things. So yeah, if you give that ease to people, they'll take advantage of it. Yeah, exactly. And the current system is you have to order a skip bin. Often you need to order it two months in advance and you only have it for two days. Uh, unfortunately, I've had a lot of old, uh, older seniors that have complained that they're unable to organize their relatives to help them out two months in advance to take their junk out. Uh, also, you know, planning three months in advance, if you've got yeah. some junk or you've got a renovation that's happening sooner than that, it's, it doesn't work out and people are having to fork out $700 for their own skip in um, at different times of the year, which doesn't help. I think, um, yeah, the system we had before did work well. For some reason they got rid of it and there wasn't much com uh, community engagement before the fact. And now we're stuck with this system and I hear from everyone that they do want it back. Um, just as a little anecdote, the first thing my uncle said to me when he heard I was running uh, for local government in the ward was bring back Verge Collections. Um, and, you know, I 100% agreed with it. Uh, and uh, I think it's worked well as a campaign message. It's definitely got my face out there a lot more. Uh, Nicole, can't hear you. Nicole. Sorry, sorry. Um, can you um, tell us more? Because I really love the Verge collections as well. I think they are important. But can you um, elaborate more as well on the rules with regards to like units and that with skipping? Actually, that's one thing I did forget to mention. Uh, I don't know specifically which units because some units are eligible. Like myself, mm -hmm. I'm in a unit complex and I am eligible for a skip bin, though my allocation does often tend to get stolen by someone from another unit. I don't know who, uh, so, you know, I end up just taking a trip to the tip. However, there are some units and I've heard this a lot while I've been out door knocking in the community that just aren't eligible for the skip bins. Um, wow. I don't know if you've got the same issue in America again, Megan, where everyone's subdividing their lots and then selling them off mm -hmm. as three houses on one property. Uh, now what's happening in Australia with that is people, you know, sell a block of land 
and cut it up into cut three up. and then sell it off, build houses on it. Often the back two units aren't actually eligible for a skip bin because of some administrative process within the city of Sterling. Um, I'm uh, not... What's a skip bin? What's that? What's a skip bin? A uh, skip oh. bin. It's um, like a temporary rubbish bin. So on a construction site, yeah. you'll see a big bin. Uh, oh, okay. Like a really big bin. bin. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Like a dumpster. Yeah. 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 Good question. <laughs> um, but w what about yourself, Nicole? You've heard these issues from people in the community? Yeah, I think they're really, really important. Um, and like you know, you do think to yourself, okay, what time, what um, time of the month? I mean, like year of the month is the skip bin coming? I mean, sorry, verge side, because some places still have verge side, right? So um, collection. So basically, you can go, okay, yep, they're coming in September or they're coming in December, and you kind of like work around that. I think a lot of people got used to it. We took it for granted, and then they're like, hey, let's do the skip bin thing, and then um, then real problems happen because people realize, wow. How am I going to get rid of this mattress, right? How am I going to get rid of this washing machine, this fridge? And we know that there's also added, you know, you get a skip bin, plus you get like one, um, you know, electric, whatever, compliance, like a washing machine. But you have to try and orchestrate when that's going to be. And then what about if you've got a dishwasher and a washing machine? You're only allowed, I think, one per year. And then your mattress, they got to go to somewhere else. And like, really, no one really wants to know all these rules. We obviously know the rules, but no one really wants to be learning as an individual, how, how, do, what do I do with my rubbish, right? <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you find yeah, people no, talk I... about that as well? Like mattresses and like, yeah, yeah. there's a whole um, lot of things. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. And there, there are so many issues trying to dispose of them. Even um, when you take mattresses to the tip, uh, you know, you've got to pay an extra fee. We did used to have those included in Verge collections that you could leave your mattresses out with it. You could leave your electronic waste out with it. I think it does lead to a cleaner community overall yeah. because going around door knocking, I see people's backyards, you know, not prying, but you see into people's properties. They they have much, heaps of junk that's piled up out there and there needs to be a time to get rid of it. Obviously, they're not ordering the skip bins or they're not able to fit in all their junk into the skip bins as well as another problem. So... And we've tried the system out. It's not working. We're getting a lot of illegal dumping around the place. And uh, I think I, I'm hoping that I can get the support of other councillors in order to, uh, mm. if I'm successful, in order to overturn it, bring back the Verge collections. So we'll likely need the votes of, you know, six councillors to get them reinstated. I know of a few that are sympathetic to the idea and hopefully if I'm elected on a by a large enough margin i'll have that mandate to bring it back and you know the city of sterling will have to do something about it that's pretty cool because i think about um the mental health right of like you know you um get rid of things it feels awesome like oh my golly megan tell us about that you know what i mean because like that's going to be impeding on people's mental health if they're like they go to this junk and they can't really do it and when we get rid of it then they're like oh, don't you reckon it'll have just such an effect on people Make well, yeah, you start taking the pride, you know, the, the mm -hmm. pride in your your home, your area, you know, once you start getting rid of, you know, what's the mental issue behind the people even having it that they didn't get rid of it in the first place, you know, um, of the, and it's also the easiness and the convenience, you know, we live in an instant gratification society where, you know, mm -hmm. it's right then and there or it's out of sight, out of mind. Um, and mm -hmm. so it's necessarily changing that atmosphere and giving that but yeah i mean when you get rid of all that trash i mean you can start dreaming and having vision about your property or you know the value of your property it goes up i mean people your neighbors don't want to see all your junk in your backyard your neighbors mm -hmm. don't want you know to be looking at that and so you not only affect by having all that stuff in your neighbor's backyard you affect your neighbor's mental health because they got to come outside they got to look at it you know they're sitting there judging you i mean it's a whole you know <laughs> down and so yeah i mean if you can clean up the communities it puts a larger mm -hmm. sense of pride within the area and it makes things look pretty where people you know start planting the trees the vegetable gardens all that type of good mm -hmm. stuff and making community gardens and different things so yeah it's a great idea 
Yeah. Yes, I love those community gardens. <laughs> Which kind of brings us to the point of like, um, so, you know, you're trying to also um, like doing a clean up kind of thing. Doing mm -hmm. a clean up. Can you tell me more about what that looks like? like... Well, <laughs> we, uh, I don't know if you, uh, which suburb uh, you're in, uh, but in the city, yeah, in the city of Sterling, there's a large difference between the wealthier suburbs and the, you know, Balga, Mirabuka, Nolamara, mm -hmm. Westminster, how they're looked after. Find often yeah. things that get dumped are acted on a lot quicker by the city of Sterling in the suburbs like Wembley, Scarborough that are close to the beach, a lot higher, there's a lot higher maintenance that goes into them. Whereas the response times for things in Nolamara, I've seen things dumped around that are left there for weeks um, before getting cleaned up. And obviously there's not as much of a sense of urgency. So on top of, you know, verge collections, which I think is just one idea that will go some way to cleaning the community up. It's not going to be everything. People are still going to dump illegal rubbish on the odd, odd occasion. Uh, so the city of Sterling does need to be quicker in acting on things within our neighbourhood. Uh, we also do need, you know, better access to the tip. And also we need to do things like uh, cleaning up verges. Yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of grown weeds in the city of Sterling that aren't getting mowed often. Uh, uh, council property, schools as well, out in front of schools where there's overgrown we weeds, they're not getting cleaned up. This mm -hmm. leads to, um, uh, I'm trying to think, perhaps a complacency in uh, the attitude that people have towards the areas of Balga, Mirabuka. I'm sure growing up in Perth, you know that stigma that the area has. It's not seen as a clean area, mm -hmm. it's not seen as the most safe area. I think if we have those neater verges, as happens in the wealthier areas of Sterling, if we have um, less junk that's left around, if we have better lighting on the streets is a big one that we need around the city. If we have these things, it overall leads to a better perception of the area and a lower likelihood for people to dump things, a lower likelihood for criminals to hang around an area if it's well lit, mm -hmm. if it's clean, if it's well protected. It's got the impression that the council is watching it all the time and it's looking after it. So uh, I think a lot of these come into cleaning up the area. I think cleaning up the area leads into a lowering of crime. Obviously, we know the stigma that the area has, Megan won't, but um, uh, both of you who live in Perth, you'll know the stigma that Dalga and Mirabuka have. Uh, if we can do something to clean up the area, I think it will lower the crime by extension. Hmm. That's good points, actually, because I know lighting is an important thing and it does lead to less crime because, you know, in some areas they're just so dark and it's like, I really want to brighten up the whole of Perth, right? And just yeah. let it shine. But we need yes. to get that like happening, yeah. Uh, ask a question. Yeah, so Michael said a lot, and uh, so I was thinking in a direction where uh, you are contesting with few other people. I mean, I have all the names of other people, but I see uh, Valable and I see other people, and they all contesting for this election. Uh, what special do you bring to the table? What special What's... do you bring to the table that you think everyone should go for Michael Duda and Michael Duda is the right person for the council election? So uh, it's an interesting question and I don't want to disparage other candidates, so I won't. Uh, though what I think I do bring, and there's a few things that are unique about my campaign, is that is the Verge Collections that I want to bring back. I was the only, uh, I am the only candidate running on that. Yeah. Um, also, I'm young. Uh, I think I'm younger than most candidates, though. Um, and again, age isn't a bad thing. You, uh, a lot of good things come with age, experience, things like that. <laughs> so um, what I think the positive, the positive aspect of me being young, being 28, is that I have energy for it. I have the energy to take calls. I have the energy to 
go and see people throughout the day, work 12, 14 hour days if I need to. Obviously, I, you know, I work my with my family business, but then you need extra hours to be able to go out and meet the community, see what they need, meet with other leaders and work on problems. So I think my age is an asset. Um, and I've got a, you know, obviously very intelligent older people around me who bring that experience too. Um, what else do I bring? I think I bring a perspective of someone who's worked within the community for many years building sports clubs. I didn't mention this in my intro. I uh, co-founded Balga Futsal Club. Um, I'm not uh, involved in the social media side of things, so that wasn't me um, posting that comment. <laughs> Killing yourself a king. Okay, then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Though I did, I was, I did co-found the club, uh, Futsal Club for Balga. They play in the State Futsal League, came runner-up last year, um, and they're travelling to the uh, nationals in Australia later on in the year. Uh, sorry, early next year. Uh, so I think the experience I bring is being involved in the Balga community, the Mirabuka community uh, for many years. The fact that I do have the energy, I'm young, I've got that passion for these issues. My involvement in the multicultural community, obviously it's a massive multicultural population within Balga and Mirabuka. Um, I think the largest in the state possibly even in Australia in terms of the percentage makeup of uh, Mira Booker and Balga. Um, so my involvement in that gives me, I think, a more personal relationship with a lot of the constituents that we have. Um, and then again, um, you know, I'm you know, growing up in the area, I live in the area every day, go through it. So it's um, not saying that other candidates don't, but I think I think I bring a lot to the table. Were you born yeah. here? Do you have you hear about the KGB? We're talking about <laughs> yeah. talking to my, to my... This term, the KGB. Uh, uh, well, I know a term called the KGB. Um, so uh, <laughs> are we talking about the same KGB? <laughs> It's I mean, like, about KGB. What what important crown in one of your campaign message? You you're focusing more on how the community can be more safe because uh, bad guys safe, other areas safe. I, I move around, imagine I, I walk down the intersection of Baga and Prince Road, where you got a park there. I take my boys there most of the time. We go and play, come back in the night. Sometimes we don't drive, we walk in the eight nine o'clock in the night, and it's pretty cool, you know. But back in the days. The message stay around the well KGB. How do you react to KGB? So just to yeah, quickly elaborate on that. KGB stands for Kandula Girawin Balga. Ah, so the area okay. of these three um suburbs that are seen as less than desirable, so to speak. Um it's this that's the slang term that's been given to it. There was even a TV show in oh. Australia on the ABC. Um, called the KGB, representing these three areas, which are seen as you know high crime areas. So that's where the the uh, KGB acronym comes from. Um, I came from Perth, and I I had no idea what you guys talked about. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. I, I, I said to myself, I said, Miko have no idea on a KGB. Yeah. Because yeah. I knew on, on the flip that. side, Michael. On the flip side, someone would say to you that the kids back in the day. There were a lot of crime around the community. So people organized the whole team, a group group of people to protect the community. And they, they were called the KGB with Galloway and Balga and Condola. So the three committees so were drawn together and have a team that was protecting the community. But the yeah, KGB yeah. originated kind of a little different, you know. I think you, you got an idea of KGB. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Um, well, perhaps perhaps that's the case. I lived in Girawain, uh it would have been five no it would have been about uh six or seven years ago now i moved from gary but um i think there is still obviously those issues with crime uh at the balga plaza shops uh, right next to the intersection you're talking about with princess reserve um my younger brother was assaulted there um about four oh. years ago when he uh was going to the shops it was at night time I think during the day, often it's a lot better um, than it is at night. Uh, obviously, I think you're you're obviously tough. No one's going to try and 
mess with you, Zico. Um, but uh, you know, it, uh, I think the the sadness is I wouldn't, I, I definitely wouldn't allow my partner for her to go out walking at night in the area. Oh, really? Which, yeah, I, I think it's it's not where it needs to be yet. There is, I mean, driving through the area at night, we see the the crime that happens. A lot of people who are um, you know, have problems with drugs, whether by their own fault or by the fault of their circumstances, you know, obviously they need some sort of help and um, whatever we can do. But I don't think the, the safety is there yet. So it it's probably improved a lot over the last few years, but I think there's still a lot we can do to, you know, to reduce the crime, clean up the area a bit as well, just to get rid of the KBG, uh, KGB perception as well. Now, let me ask a question, you know, be naive, not from there. In this area, are there lots of sports? I mean, this area of what you're running, are mm. is there a lot of community sports? There is. Um, so I used to play for Balga Soccer Club, which is the main air, uh, main soccer club. At, it's at the very park that Zico was just referencing their base. I think they're, they've done the best thing so far i think in the area to try and help these youth get involved in the community they offer they're the only club in wa to offer fee free football so soccer uh, when they say football they mean soccer here it's a bit odd in australia where some people call it football some soccer and it's a bit of a mix um though they offer fee free uh soccer to all their youth players so no matter what your parents income uh you can go play for them. I think uh, you donate a bit of your time volunteering in exchange for it, volunteering at the club, and then you get to play for the year for free. The major issue with soccer in Australia is how expensive it is. Um, when I was growing up, it was four or $500 a year uh, yeah. to play. Um, some years my parents couldn't afford it, so I went without it. Other years they could, but nowadays I think it's almost double the price for some of the academies. But about four or five hundred is the minimum you'll pay nowadays at any club. So I think Balga Soccer Club offering this fee free soccer initiative uh, is goes a long way to it to help the community get disengaged youth involved within a club environment um, and with other people. Uh, there are a few other clubs as well. Uh, Cricket Club is at that reserve. It's also a football club, Balga Football Club down the road, which is Australian rules football. Uh, they do a lot for the kids there. What I hear from all of these clubs, though, uh, is that there's not enough support given to them from the city of Stirling. Their facilities are outdated. Uh, they've been there since the, since the buildings were built in the 70s or 80s, uh, and there hasn't been that, you know, uh, up, upkeep, uh, which I think is needed, again, just for the overall uh look of the area uh but also to give the kids something more to be invested in as opposed to an older building that they don't feel the need so much to preserve and you know help thrive yeah but i completely mm -hmm. agree with that i mean that kind of goes into also the pride aspect of you know i mean even for kids um you know we we in the united states we have those areas you know the we, they're called low income areas of, you know, and they're very, you know, diverse, divided where there's areas that, you, you know, you don't go to. But even those kids see that because they hear parents constantly talking about, you know, the wealthy versus, you know, the low mm -hmm. income. And so if there were, were money invested into those, that gives those kids a sense of pride, you know, not just, oh, well, we're just going to go do it, you know, that, oh, people actually do care about us. So, look, they have we have these facilities. And when you start to instill that in children at a young age, you know, that grows with them. But, you know, sports is one of the greatest ways to bring people together where you put away all your differences and you come together as a team and, you know, in multi um, diverse um, cultures because of the fact that nothing else matters except for what that team has now been brought together. And so, I mean, there's so many studies, you know, on mental health wellness about what sports can actually do for a community. So that's a great thing that that club offers that to that opportunity for people to come together for a common goal 
to be proud of, but yeah, the city needs to invest money into the facilities to yeah. help. Yeah, exactly. Exactly that. You know, th this club is doing so much for the community by offering these kids that place to be involved. And I think in return, the government, our local government needs to do more to support the club and give them the resources they need to provide an even better environment for these kids, keep them off the streets at night. Exactly. That is, you know, community days, you know, and maybe not even necessarily that, you know, you need a lot, but have, you know, community days that people come out, take care of, mm -hmm. we'll have lawn equipment, come cut the grass, come, come do all this stuff, make it a big deal. That mm -hmm. gives kids so much excitement. People care about us, you know, and ultimately that's what mm -hmm. everyone wants. That everyone wants to feel that they're important and that they matter. And so, you know, just providing that little oomph, you know, it goes such a long way. And then, yeah, you won't have the kids out there destroying stuff. You won't have the kids out there doing that because they actually have a sense of pride within themselves. 100% agree. That is so true. One of my friends, Yvonne, said it's a leftover name from way back in the early 80s. I didn't even know that. I didn't actually grow up in that area, but I know about it. And I'm like, I know that area. I totally know what you're talking about. Um, you and should, then, um, um, yeah. just briefly on the KGB before you move on, um, you should look up an ABC iView show called KGB. It was uh, made okay. by a friend of mine I went to pre-primary with. Um, but it was quite good. It takes 25 minutes to watch through the series, and it's funny. Go on, really? Please. That would be funny. And again, to give me a brief of what I'm going to be watching, though. <laughs> it's um, well, it's just it's it follows two police officers in the area, basically. Um, oh so, wow! Yeah, okay. it's like the cops show that used to air in America. <laughs> it's Australian <laughs> cops will be, I think, so so different to anything you'd expect from uh, police officers in America. So it brings a lot of the. Uh, a lot of Australianisms into it that you know might come as a shock to you, though it might not, seeing as you you're speaking with Australians many weeks. So um, maybe you're already uh, you're already engrossed in it. And I only know Australia, so like <laughs> I'm like her world is I'm oblivious to that. Yeah, yeah. surprise me, it surprised me. Nico, Nico don't have an idea on a KGB when someone just make a comment and say. Is a left or a name? It was it, it was that name was all around when, when we had it in the eighties. Was the it like tagged everywhere or something? Was it like KGB tagged and stuff everywhere? Because maybe I'd know that. I, I don't think I think KGB originated from Russia. Yeah, something like oh. yeah. It was yeah. The mob. But how do you know about KGB? Like, I've never heard of that. Like that. Like. How, how do you know about but i'm not from that area so is that the thing like it, it is okay. tagged around places um oh, okay. there is yeah. graffiti that says it but it is yeah. it just yeah it, the acronym stands for kandula giroe in balga um yeah, i can okay. tell you about the origins of how it uh, started being called that Zico would be able yeah. to tell you a bit more yvonne even would be able to elaborate more, but it does stand for yeah. Kandula Kirawe and Balga, those three suburbs. Well, that totally makes sense when you say Yeah, the three, the three suburbs in Nisha, KGB. So it sounds sweet, but back in the day, it was kind of a little different, the meaning of the KGB. Yeah. That's what I, that's what well, I hear from other people, you know. You know, there's a lot yeah. of psychology behind that aspect and, you know, an area yeah. giving them the self, the nickname uh, uh, of the KGB, uh, 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 and for what the KGB stood for. KGB. You're, you're well, telling well, the community. Well, well, I think it's the organization. Yeah. Mm. Well, it's, a, it's the Russian spy agency, um, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of the organization called mm. that within yeah. the area. No, but that's possibly how the people felt about themselves. You know, they feel yeah. they're very hardcore onto that. They're going to protect their community. They're going to protect their own and they're going to do what they have to do um, to do that, whether that's legal or not or what. But you do have areas that do that. You know, they stand for their own because they feel that they've been let go by, you know, community government. They feel that, you know, that they, they don't matter. So you have people who stand up you know, for those groups. That's where, you know, in the United States, that's the same issue of all the gangs. You know, that's why you have all the gangs that start out is because they feel abandoned. They, you know, the abandonment wounds, they feel that they don't matter to society. And so they form these gangs in areas and they claim this area, they claim that area, they claim that. And, but then unfortunately you have the rival gangs because they stand for something different. You know, gangs are a huge problem in the United States. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, that with the Black Panthers as well. 
I think that was the 80s or 90s. Um, the 80s. Yeah, okay. But now you have so many. I mean, if you Google, like, gangs in, in the United States, I mean, you're going to have over, like, a thousand that pop up because, oh. you know, just many different things. They agree about this, that, and then you have someone in that group that hates that thing, so they go and create another one, and they get their followers to come over here, you know, and so, I mean, but ultimately, it's because of they don't feel they belong. They don't feel a sense of belonging. They don't feel a sense of pride. I mean, it all comes down to that self aspect of rebuilding that community of that. We yeah. are all working together. That's true. That's why we, um, we like say with the childcare industry, um, we came up with, um, belong being and becoming because we want children to feel like they belong and they're becoming and being who they are, you know, like that's their whole framework for zero to five year olds and it also goes on to 12 year olds if you do the my time our place framework so like um um they've already jumped onto that but i can which i think is so important right because it really does matter about the younger people and then just um breaking off those stigmas you know and giving them a sense of pride where they are but i think if we do um um improve like say because um you know her bram mm -hmm. Right, Center? Yep. Yep. Yeah, I yeah. Play, you know, that's where my soccer club plays. Ah, yeah, I've been there. Um, that's a whole different feel um, to like like Jingle Up area, you know. So, um, yeah, that's a different thing. I was actually teaching there, and but um, yeah, there's quite a big difference, right? <laughs> Sorry, mm. it's like no, no, there is, and um, <laughs> my soccer club, yeah, plays on the. Herb Graham Reserve, just behind the recreation center there. Yeah. Uh, and unfortunately, um, again, this is another issue in our area that, uh, you know, I don't want to demonize these people. These people. Uh, they're obviously having problems. Uh, the, a lot of homeless that, you know, are having to mm -hmm. find shelter around the clubs there. Obviously, obviously. It's, uh, there's, there's a problem that there needs to be solved. But, uh, you know, the issue that comes with this is there's a lot of syringes that get left behind. There's a lot of rubbish that gets left behind. Um, overall, you know, the cleanliness aspect and a lot of alcohol being brought into the area at the same place, which is a park where kids play. So um, now there are laws I, I against that. <laughs> yes. Yes, there are. Uh, the security hmm. situation in the area is a lot um a lot more lax than you get in other parts of Perth. So, you know, someone drinking in a park in Mirabuka is not gonna get the police to act um anywhere near as quickly or um people to call about it, uh that it will in perhaps Wembley or um Scarborough, Sorrento, some of the nicer areas in Perth. So there are laws against it um but i guess whether it's a blind eye that's turned or not enough eyes on the street within the community alerting police officers to the activity um whatever it is you know there is that issue now, is there I any think, type of like anonymous lines to like i mean is that possibly a reason as to why people aren't like is there a way that people could report people but do it anonymously and that people don't find out about it so they're not considered a rat uh, there is, uh, and you can call the police anonymously too in Australia. So you don't need to give your name, uh, when you make mm. a report, uh, though, uh, just making a report's not going to do too much, you know, uh, oh, drinking yeah. in a park will likely get you a move on notice as opposed to a specific yeah. fine, or even if it gives you, it does get you a fine, you know, uh, it's not going to get paid so to speak. A lot of these people aren't, um, you know, they're homeless, so they don't have, they're not involved in the same sort of economy that we are, where we get letters to our house with fines, um, things like that. Obviously, we don't want to lock people up if they're homeless, um, but we do want to try and get them support. Uh, I think, obviously, um, a lot of these solutions come from uh, reaching kids at a young age and giving them the support services, giving them community outlets to be able to get involved. Uh, but there also needs to be some things on the other end for adults who 
are experiencing this and experiencing drug addiction, alcohol addiction, addiction homelessness, whatever it is. Um, so things need to be done on both ends. Some of them I won't have the power to do as a local member mm -hmm. in local government, uh, but whatever is in my power, I do want to try and help out. Um, again, you know, I'm very close to it. Um, that being the soccer club I play for, I see these issues. Um, and I don't like the fact that the park is, a lot of parents are scared to take their kids to the park there because of the people that are hanging around. Yeah, and I know that, Megan, you've got good questions. And I guess, because I was brought up in Perth, so I, I'm a, I'm, I just know that that's what's going to happen. If I go to those areas, I know the environment, I know the atmosphere, I know what's going to be, I know what to expect. Um, I might do certain things that will protect me even more or what I think will protect me even more. Um, you know, and, like, I love your heart for, like, wanting to help them because, you know, it's always about being for being you know having a voice for people that they feel like they can't have a voice so i love um that you're about that and i love the fact that like you do want to try and advocate for them you know and the fact that you have that you already know it like because when you're saying that i already know stuff that you don't even need to say that i totally get it and then like, hmm, well, no i mean but i'm looking I'm, at it as a mental health standpoint of, yeah. uh, you know it's it's the bad thing about that and, and those areas is that it's just become accepted. Well, why has it become accepted? Mm -hmm. You know, we have to change the mental health stigma is that it's, this is an accepted behavior and you need to have the community. There's some, there's no pride within the community there. You know, if you're just sitting there allowing this stuff to go by and this is accepted behavior, you're accepting that, you know, your children get to walk down the streets and see this. You're accepting that your kids, witness this on an occasion well where is the sense of pride within you you know so i mean it just sounds like in an overall essence mental health in the community just needs to really be addressed as to where and how and why why did the pride leave the area you know has it always been that you know um has it just gotten worse and because of of neglect but you know it's not just the community being neglected it's the people neglecting themselves um, and then they're teaching the children the, the same aspect. And so it's it, the question is, is, why is it accepted that th these behaviors are accepted in this area? And it's blind eyes because of the fact that it's accepted behavior. And we have to change that, that it's not accepted behavior and that we have to be those role models. Um, and, you know, really reaching out to the older of that, you know, you can teach an old dog new tricks, you know, you, you can change your life, you know, you, you can do these things, but it all has to start with self. Um, and it's so, yeah, yeah. It just, my heart is just kind of going out to the whole mental health area of, of that area is that, and, you know, in, in government, you, you see the stats and the statistics. Yeah. I mean, there, there is, you know, the finances, did jobs leave, did this, did these type of things. So what type of things are being replaced into the area? So, I mean, on, you know, a standpoint, I mean, you can pinpoint it. And so it's, mm. you got to rebuild that. So that's what's just running through my mind. <laughs> sitting here listening to it all. Yeah, no, and definitely. Uh, and the point you make about pride needing to be in the area, people needing to make reports and not being accepted beha behavior is, um, is very true. Uh, though they are difficult problems and, you know, the solutions that, are required aren't going to happen overnight but no well you know, the lack of pride won't happen overnight yeah yeah no 100 percent um but i think you know my aim if i can by the end of my term uh clean up the area a bit restore some sense of pride um perhaps reduce crime as much as possible and mm. just continue to improve on the area like you know I, i've uh perhaps been speaking too negatively about the area because it has made strides in recent years it's not uh it has gotten better the crime rate has reduced as it has around perth so there are some strides being made though there are some activities that are far too common and are seen as accepted uh throughout that do need to you know, be eradicated as quickly as possible and that's my goal to hopefully try and do that to the best of my ability I was going to ask, like, what are some positives of the area? Like, there's got to be, you know, um, that's one thing I do love uh, uh, kind of about here is that, you know, like festivals, 
Oh, great thing. Well, there's got to be something that that area besides crime or something that, you know, they're, they're known about. What's like famous stores? What, what restaurant? You know, what what type of that, you know, you can bring people into those areas on those. So it's like. Hmm. Well, I yeah. And I speak about the problems because I'm a politician. Obviously, I'm trying to fix the things that are wrong with it. There are a lot of positives. It's a melting pot. It's a great multicultural community and most aspects of it work very well. The, we have a lot of uh, people come through and be successful from these multicultural backgrounds um, mm, yeah. from the community. And also um, a lot of great sports people, a lot of people coming through the schools there. I mean, I uh, went to school uh, around the area in Warwick High School I went to. Um, current Australian senators went to school in, the, um, in Mirabuka. So there are a lot of good things that come out of it, uh, though I think the reason that, you know, the negatives are being focused on is because they are quite evident. There is a lot of crime in the area. Um, it's in certain pockets, um, but that is what people want to get rid of because they know that the area has potential being so close to the city. There's the potential for it to be very high property values, um, things like that. Uh, though what's holding it back is a stigma that's been there for years and, you know, some other things. But again, I don't want to focus on the negatives too much. I have to, to some extent, um, as my campaign is run on fixing the area to the extent I can. But um, Well, you have to there acknowledge are... the negative to come up with solutions to be the positive. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah so Michael. my friend... Eve Vodhingham oh. said, um, a lot is all is related to in, intergeneral trauma and poverty, racism, and low socioeconomic. Would you agree, Michael? Uh, yes, yes, definitely intergenerational trauma. Um, obviously, everything starts with parents. There is that aspect of it. There is the aspect of racism in the past. And people who grow up in lower socioeconomic areas do tend to um, become adults in low socioeconomic environments as well, though yeah. it's not the case always. And mm -hmm. obviously past racism is a shame what's happened to different, uh, different cultures, the Indigenous, uh, I guess, in Australia's case. The solutions aren't simple, and a lot of it comes from great individuals in these communities overcoming the difficulties that their parents have faced, perhaps that they've yeah. faced, and yeah. making something of themselves. Often it means working a tiny bit harder than uh, perhaps uh, other Australians may have had to. Um, mm. Though it's... It's not the whole story, and it is a it is a very difficult problem to find solutions to. All I can say is that I really admire people who do overcome that and who do uh, put in that harder work that they need to in order to overcome the obstacles that have been thrown at them uh, to make something mm -hmm. of themselves. So um, that is the best way to get out of it. And then obviously there's other things that the federal government can do to try and help. Michael, you bring a lot to the table for your conversation and your campaign message. Yeah. I think there are a lot of good things to talk about, but what would be your core responsibility if elected this November? My core responsibility, did you say? Your core responsibility, yeah, when you get elected. Uh, four, did you say, the number four? Yeah, no, I mean, what would be your own responsibility? What would you be on the What would be obligated to? Oh, okay. What well, my responsibilities are as local government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what do you need to focus on? Yeah. It's like that. Cause well, you know, they might not know about different. Yeah. You know? Okay. <laughs> well, the three main things in local government, it's become about a whole lot of other things in recent years, but the three main things you get to focus on <laughs> that I'll need to focus on if elected is roads, um, making sure the roads are well maintained, uh, rates. So how much taxes people pay on their property to uh, fund the work that, I do and the many staff members of the city of Sterling do and um, rubbish. 
So they're the, they've always been the three main responsibilities of local government. Roads, rates, rubbish, the three R's is how you say it. Um, they'll, be, they'll be the things I need to focus on most. The rubbish is a big one for me, obviously, and especially in the area we're running in. I want to try and clean it up as much as possible. Roadside verges I want to try and clean up. Um, and rates, I've also, I haven't spoken about this at all, but I am running on the platform of freezing rates for two years as well. I think rates have been increasing constantly while the services the government, the local government provides have been decreasing, um, especially as an example, the verge collections with the year they were taking out, taken away, the taxes, the local government rates um, increased uh, the most they had in 10 years. So, you know, you've got this decrease of services coupled with this increase in taxes. Um, I do want to freeze rates. And then there's other responsibilities. Crime obviously is a state government issue, that there are things we can do at a local level to decrease the incidence of crime. And that's what I've been talking about. Um, parks obviously are a local government responsibility, but in terms of crime, the things we can do is better lighting around the streets, cleaning up the area, providing more security patrols, security actors, eyes on the street for police officers. I don't know if you have a similar system in the US, Megan, where there's uh, security which have lesser powers. They don't carry guns or anything, but they just patrol the streets and then call uh, the police if needed. I'm sure you've got neighborhood watch groups and such that do that. Neighborhood watch, and you also have a civilian group, please, where you can go through like a half part of the police academy. And I mean, you're yeah. not allowed to carry a gun or anything like that, but you have the ability to arrest someone as a citizen um, in yep. areas and stuff. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very similar. So increasing those patrols around the area, I think, is uh, integral to that. And then um, another thing local government can do on crime is uh, funding for sports clubs, for parks and such. So I think, uh, you know, if I can do something there and support the clubs that are supporting the youth, then that'll help reduce that. But, you know, key responsibilities to answer the question briefly again, roads, rates, and rubbish. Good. Yeah. Well, Nicole, Nicole I think we, clo we closed the hour in the conversation. Yeah, I know. With I, know. I know, but I want you to ask just like maybe one or two questions about the slang that you wanted to talk to him about, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah, uh, uh, Michael being someone who, who was born in in the neighborhood, I understand a lot of different slang. I think you'll be responding to a few of this slang. I will show it to him, and he tell what it means. You know, it's gotta be fun, real difficult. You know, catching up with Australian slang, and it's not an easy thing. You know, so I gotta be sharing it to you. I don't yeah. think Nicole know other than, but make it Marie will be make it Marie make it Marie will be learning something tonight. So you're gonna be telling her what those slang stand for. So we got first Bracky. Can you see this clip? No. Oh. Be close no. to the screen. Is it clear? If it's not clear, tell me. It's B R O B R E K K Y. Bracky. What is Bracky? Oh, Bracky. <laughs> yeah. <What is> Bracky? <laughs> That's like Bracky. So am I letting Nicole guess first, or should I say? <laughs> Nicole. That's breakfast. That's like, what do you what do you want for brekkie? Like, what do you want for breakfast? Like that. Uh uh, so 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 everything got a little simple tonight. I don't <laughs> let's try to go. Okay, let's go this. Let's let's go this. Let's, shop, ah. let's go to another one. Try this. Wait. What? Yeah, I can't say that. What is that? You got it? Eshe bar. Ah, uh, what what that mean? What is that? Um, I don't know what the slang actually means, though I do know it's a certain subculture of Australian youth. So there's a certain uh, personality type in Australian teenagers uh, that refer to themselves as eshes, or other people call them eshes. I'm not too sure what it is. Um, and I'm not sure how to describe it. You'd have to look it up on uh, YouTube. I don't even know that one. Eshe. Um, <laughs> and you'll get an example of what one is. Okay. E okay, Michael. Let's look, look at this. 
What 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 blogger me? B L U D G E R blogger. 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 Ah, I'm not answering that. You can do that, Michael. First. <laughs> Michael, so, tell um, what blog. Who well, uh, Megan? Do you know what a bludger is? I'm thinking it's a tool to kill someone. So, oh, <laughs> oh <my> God. God. <laughs> so you're gonna bludger them to death. Oh gosh. Okay, that's, that's funny. Okay, that's sorry. not a uh, bad guess, actually. But no, it's um a bludger <laughs> in Australia is someone who uh, perhaps doesn't work hard or is seen to be <laughs> mooching off the system. So yeah. you might call someone a uh, a dull bl- a dull bludger. Which is someone yeah. who's getting uh, unemployment benefits without working, who perhaps has the capability to. Um, mm-hmm. Though it also, if someone's a bludger, they might be mooching off someone else as well. So not, uh, you know, just not working hard, not putting in their their fair share. Yeah, that's uh, a good good. Nicole, you want to talk about that? A bludger? Yeah, like you could, you know, you could do, you could also be a blood, blood like I like that. I straight away think about a dog bludger, right? Only because it's got such a full on thing. They're just sitting around, Centrelink or whatever, just drinking. They're just, you know, letting their day go by kind of thing, not really being um, active in the community in that sense. Um, but obviously, bludgers can be like other ones where, um, you know, they're just bludging off people, sometimes children might be referred to you know stop being a bludger go and like work go and get a job like it's just how they talk i, I didn't actually use that word but um oh you don't use australian slang what about this broly no, i just don't use that word because it's like oh anyway i'm more positive remember okay what's that what? one broly let's call the welfare system here in the united states oh he's gonna say broly that's an umbrella <laughs> <laughs> So that's what one I've never actually that? heard myself, Broly. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. I don't use it either. I don't even know why I don't use all this slang. I just don't. I just don't talk like that. But um, sometimes they can. But, but yeah, no, those, those, slangs, those, those slangs are used on a daily basis of more people, you know. And if you can't understand them, it, it can be found difficult, you know, when they're Australian speaking. And, and again, our whole conversation in the slang, you know, you can't kind of confuse what they're talking about, you know. <laughs> if, well, someone if someone says you're a bludger, if someone calls you a bludger and you don't know what a bludger is, it, you mean you, you're not working now? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know everyone will know this here in Australia. Chrissy. What? Chrissy. Ah, oh. Chrissy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> favorite time of year. Megan Murray, what's the slang for Christmas in America? Xmas. Uh, that's my that's it. Xmas. Yeah, now we say gonna see our family for Chrissy. For Chrissy. Yeah. <laughs> People go into Brisbane is it Brizzy. <laughs> yeah, here Brizzy. in the United States, Christmas is that real, you know, it is that time between non-believers and believers and stuff. So there's that real fight of to keep Christmas into yes. it so and like people get very offended when you do say xmas or you know so th- there's quite that battle here onto it but now it is christmas or xmas yeah yeah they have that here too it's like happy holidays instead of christmas but i'm all about christmas <laughs> yeah. yeah so we christmas. had a good chat with mega uh Marco. i think we we gotta go now We've been yeah. for 45 minutes, more than an hour now, and it was really good with Michael giving the solid. Yeah. You know, I really love the message, really the campaign the message. message. Campaign message. Everywhere, Everywhere he go, message. what he said to people, I think there's a hope, you know, and I'm hoping that he be elected, you know, so he can bring that say into reality, you know, all the things you mentioned, mentioned, he can bring it to reality. We know it's not an easy thing. Not all you mentioned come to reality, but the fact that you can take a step, you know, to do some of the things you talk about. It would be a good idea. So thank you, I would say, for my end. Thank you, Michael, for honoring our invitation. You know, I'm waking up, making my read from the U.S. this morning to be a part of the mm-hmm. conversation. It's I think it's a good 12. idea. Yeah, she feels special. She's a strong lady, so she always up. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. You know, so we go, I think we're going to go to Michael to give her a parting statement or the final statement for tonight yeah. before we conclude. What you want to yeah. see, what the message to constituents, people in Baga, Gilawin, and Condola, all the other area 
to make that decision so we can have a flying color for you this November. Yeah. It will be a November to remember. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah. Um, and yeah, guys, I really do appreciate you having me on today to speak about these issues. Um, it's really good. We uh, find out the results on Friday, which is your final day to vote, Friday, November 25th coming up um in the next few days if anyone watching hasn't voted yet you can vote at mirror booker library um up until thursday and on the final friday you can vote at the city of sterling building in uh suburb of sterling so um if you haven't done that i'd recommend going to vote in person if you still got your postal vote you'd want to post that off today or tomorrow for it to be counted in time um but otherwise i do appreciate you having me on to talk about these issues um obviously if we can do something about the rubbish situation uh do something to reduce the crime in the area and uh something to help the area grow uh, by giving funding to sports clubs and other community groups and the seniors in the area that need it as well um i'll be very happy to um and if i'm successful on friday i'd love to come back on sometime as the elected councillor for the area so you know, hoping and praying. Um, and we'll see how it goes in the end. Wonderful. Mega Marie, can you conclude for us? Michael, claim it. Don't hope for it. Claim it. Claim <laughs> it. It is your position. Manifest it. <laughs> Another Appreciate bottle it. sticker. Yeah. Yeah, and so if you want to find out more as well about Michael's journey and what he's doing and all the causes and his, um, you know, hear more of his voice, you can go to his um, Facebook page, yeah? Yeah, that's uh, Michael Dudek for Balga Ward uh, currently. Um, and, yeah, you'll find it on Facebook, Michael Dudek, D-U-D-E-K, um, for Balga Ward. Awesome. Well done. Thank you, Michael. Bye -bye. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much. <laughs> See ya. Bye. See ya. Bye.